Hey, Father Cristino, I heard a Catholic priest say that all people are called to marriage, and that Catholic priest was you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you've outed me. <laughs> now, some could interpret that as, oh, that Father Cristino, he's a liberal priest. What do you mean? Is he denying the priesthood? What does that mean, all people are called to marriage? Maybe uh, clarify that for us. Sure. I think I better uh, state right at the outset that I'm a very happy celibate and that I maintain that the church should never relax uh, the discipline of celibacy for our priests in the, in the Latin church. The uh, point I was making, maybe too provocatively, was that God has designed us for union with him. Uh, that is what heaven is. Heaven is eternal union with God. And he has created us with the uh, goal of us being united with him forever in heaven. And so that's why we have marriage in this life in the first place. It's a foreshadowing uh, of the union that we are meant to share forever with God, which is why we have consecrated and celibate vocations in the life of the church, because those people, those consecrated religious and, and celibate priests, become like a signpost uh, to remind everybody else of the union to which we are ultimately called, which transcends marriage itself. And that's why our Lord in the gospel, when the Sadducees are trying to trap him over the doctrine of the resurrection, they give that uh, silly parable about the woman who was married to seven brothers, none of them having had children with her before they each died. And then they say, in the resurrection that you claim there's going to be, Whose wife will she be? And he says, in heaven there will be neither the giving nor the taking of, of, sp of spouses in marriage. And his point was, we will be united with God. And so that's why I say we are all called to marriage. Uh, but to whom and when we will live that is what we are meant to determine and discern in this life. You had... Um... I know in the previous conversations expressed maybe some frustration with young men as your role as vocations director when they say something like, well, I'm not, uh, would you have you th think about the priesthood? And they say, no, 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 I'm, I'm called to marriage. Right. What, well, that's your the number one response. <laughs> <laughs> I, but I, I always say, well, then to whom? You can't be called to marriage uh, in general, you have to, you, you marry a person. So when someone says, oh, I, I no, thanks, Father. No, I'm, I don't want to go on the come and see weekend. I'm discerning marriage. Who are you discerning marriage with? If there isn't a person that you are intending to marry, you're not discerning marriage. What you're saying is, I sense in my heart a call to be married. I feel called to unite myself to another person. And to that I say, yes, you are called to that. We are all called to that. We all have the longing for marriage written into our hearts. But that does not mean, therefore, that you're not called to a consecrated or celibate vocation in the church, or possibly even a celibate uh, vocation outside of the church. We all know people who, maybe it would seem just by the circumstances of their life, simply never married. That does not mean that they did not have the longing in their heart. It means that either by providence or simply by circumstances, that opportunity didn't present itself. And so they have been called to live out their baptism in another way, in a way that gives witness to the life of service and self-sacrifice that we should all uh, be striving to live out on a day-to-day -day basis. So the feeling that you have in your heart doesn't necessarily indicate you're not called to consecrated life or priesthood just because you feel drawn to be married to someone. I would say, of course you do, because God designed us all that way. The question of how we will live that out and with whom and whether or not it will even be in this life, that's what's to be discerned. Because we are all called to be longing for union with God in heaven. So uh, to 
to clarify then, it would be a mistake for a young man to say, well, uh, I don't, the only way that I will consider the priesthood is if I don't feel attracted to, to marriage. Right. Well, uh, guys have said that to me, like, I don't think so, Father. I like girls too much. <laughs> and I think, well, what do you think about me? What, was, I, <laughs> was I blind? <laughs> or I, uh, I considered myself so undesirable of a future spouse that I thought I better just become a priest. You don't, you don't just settle for the priesthood because you don't seem to be able to find a wife. <laughs> so when you like girls, that's not an indication that you're not called. On the contrary, it's actually... Uh, something I would prefer to know, <laughs> that you do feel called to married life. You would like to see yourself married. You do want to give yourself in love to another person. You should have that as a prerequisite for the priesthood. I don't want a guy to go to the seminary who says, yeah, I can't stand women and I would never want to have children, so where do I sign up? I'd say, well, not in my diocese. I don't want... <laughs> a future priest who has an attitude like that, because that is not a, a, a posture of being prepared to make a gift of yourself, which is what the priesthood requires of us. And doesn't it cause great problems within the priesthood if you have priests who have no desire for marriage? Well, we're living through that still to this day. Uh, I, I'm not going to go too far into the weeds on this, but... If as a priest, you cannot bring yourself to see yourself as a man, a husband, who is married to a bride and has children, if you, if you can't conceive of yourself in that way, you cannot live the priesthood in a healthy manner, at least. You will either live your priesthood poorly, or worse yet, you will scandalize the church and cause grave harm to others. It, the, the priest is a man because Jesus Christ was a man, and he is a husband because as Christ, alter Christus, he has taken the bride of Christ, the church, for his own. Uh, I, I always tell the story about on the day of my diaconal ordination, that's when uh, those who are preparing for priesthood take their promise of celibacy. And, and that was what I was so nervous about leading up to that moment. I just... I was terrified that I was closing that door forever. Uh, but that was the moment of, of most freedom in my life when I finally just said yes to the bride of Christ. What an mm. honor that I got to take Christ's own bride as my own that day. Uh, and my father, after that uh, beautiful mass, uh, he, could, he, he's, he grew over the years, so he didn't fit his original wedding band uh, anymore. <laughs> Uh, he, my mom had got him a new wedding band on their 25th anniversary. Uh, so he, but he still had that, that first wedding band that he wore. And he gave it to me. And he said, son, just remember, just because you don't have a wife doesn't mean you're not married. Right? I, I, I am called to live out my life as a married man. Uh, after the example of my father who lived a sacrificial life, who put his wife and his children ahead of himself, who worked tirelessly to provide for us. Those are all the qualities that I tried to live in my priestly ministry. And I learned them from my married father because I also need to live as a celibate man in the same way. Uh, priests who think that they're bachelors and, and live a bachelor's lifestyle uh, will become selfish and grumpy, and uh, dissatisfied with their priestly ministry. We need to say, no, no, I am I'm a father of many children. I have a very large family, and so I need to work very hard to provide for their needs. And I need to do it cheerfully. Well, you put that so well. In fact, I don't think I've ever heard a priest put it quite like the way that you did, that you do not want a priest in your diocese a potential priest in diocese who could not have seen himself as a father married with children. Right. It, it's funny because our way of thinking of the priesthood is, well, you have to be more attracted to the priestly duties 
And for some reason, therefore, you could have never seen yourself as a, as a biological father. And that was so far removed from reality that therefore the default, well, there, therefore you must be called to be a priest. Well, the, I had a spiritual director. Uh, actually, no, not it was my formation advisor in the seminary. Uh, I had the same priest who accompanied me through the course of my formation for the whole eight years that I was there. He, he was truly like a, a father to me. And I, I shared with him once saying, because we begin being scrutinized the closer we get to ordination, about our understanding of priestly celibacy and the freedom in which we should be accepting that call. And we were talking about it once. And I did say to him, you know, I, I hope that I haven't just avoided marriage out of fear that I, I wouldn't be a good husband or I... Uh, no woman would want to marry me. Like I did. I was afraid that maybe there was some part of myself that I was just pretending wasn't there, that thought in that way. And he said to me, I've known you now for a long time. And I think what you've come to realize is that you have more love in your heart to give than you could possibly direct to just one person. And that immediately resonated with me. That's when I realized it's not that I don't want a wife. It's not that I'm not attracted to women, that I don't think married life is so very beautiful. I was raised in a, in a home with a very beautifully married couple. It's none of those things. It's that I just knew I couldn't contain in one relationship with X number of children the, the love for God that I felt he was asking me to to share with all of his children. And that becomes the essence of the priesthood then. Uh, it, it's the very opposite of maybe not being capable of, of the right kind of love. And so I guess I have to go and be a priest. It's rather that there's too much love that God has placed in this broken, weak heart of mine. And, and the healing and the strength of that heart becomes the giving of that love uh, to as many as, as it can be given. Hmm. I want to take uh, the conversation slightly to a different direction. I met a young man recently who said he was in the mushy middle father. He didn't know if he was called to the priesthood or he didn't call know if he was called to marriage. He said he'd never really been in a relationship before. And his spiritual director gave him the advice of, well, Maybe you should go around and, and start dating uh, young women to, to figure out if you might be called to marriage. That just didn't seem right to me on a number of levels, but I want you to respond first to that. Was that well, good advice? As you are aware, I have this allegedly controversial opinion <laughs> about dating in general, but I, I do not advise... People And I don't want to contradict this young man's spiritual director because he is giving him that advice within a broader context of who he is. So I don't want to sound like I'm correcting what the spiritual director said. He will have his own reasons for the advice that he is giving, and they pertain to him, not in general. But I can say, generally speaking, that it is not a helpful principle of discernment to go and try out the opposite of something to determine whether or not I'm called to the other thing. Uh, because what that does is it, put, it pits things against each other where now it's not a matter of me accessing my freedom uh, and making a decision from out of my will. It's me responding to my emotional reactions to something. Well, I liked this and I didn't like that. Or I liked this more than I liked that. Uh, we do that with food. Uh, you do that with wine. You don't do that with your vocation. And so if I sense that I might be called to something, then I should immerse myself in that uh, and see what is the response of my heart to that experience. So when a young man tells me he thinks he's called to priesthood or he's afraid that he might be called to priesthood, but he's not sure because he's never dated. First thing I say nowadays is good. I'm glad that you haven't just aimlessly wandered around and tried on different girls for size. That's not 
how we should experience authentic relationship. I want to know, how do you relate to women? Are you friends with any girls? Do you spend time with women? Uh, are you awkward or uncomfortable around women? If that's the case, we need to deal with that uh, irrespective of whether it's priesthood or marriage. Because one way or the other, you need to be comfortable and capable of interacting with women in an appropriate manner. So that's its own standalone issue. If you think, oh no, I, I have lots of girls that are friends, I, I'm comfortable, there's no issues there, I just haven't had one as a girlfriend. Well, what, what that should mean is, I haven't seriously discerned marriage with someone, therefore I better do that before I discern the priesthood. And I'm saying, well, no, because you, you can't seriously discern something unless you put yourself into it. If you seriously discern the priesthood, you will step out of it with confidence that you should go and get married. But if you seriously discern marriage because of that longing in our heart that God has created us with, you may just never bother thinking about the priesthood. You didn't give it a, a chance. You didn't... Uh, allow yourself to be immersed in that possibility. If the possibility even enters your mind, you need to give it more careful consideration. Because for the vast majority of Catholic men, it's just not even going to cross their mind. From the time they're 15 or 16 onwards, they only, they're a heat-seeking missile to find a wife. And, and that's normal. There's, I'm not suggesting that a Catholic man who's not thought about the priesthood did something wrong. If the Lord did not put the inspiration in your mind, then there's not, no reason to have made it up. But if there is that inspiration, then you don't attest it by immersing yourself in the alternative. And in a way, I, I was asked, I was so young when I went to the seminary, I had family members who said, well, why don't you go and try something else first and see if you still want to become a priest? And I don't know, it must have been an inspiration from the Holy Spirit, but I asked one time, or I, I said in response, if I told you I wanted to be a lawyer, would you tell me to go to medical school to see if I still wanted to be a lawyer? <laughs> and they just laughed. I said, well, I, no, I guess not. I said, well, so why would I go and try the opposite thing? It's because you are afraid I might actually go through with what I'm saying. And that's not... Uh, really a, a, a good reason to try on something else for size. Uh, you touched on something that uh, kind of made me think of my journey with Janelle into the sacrament of matrimony. Um, I think that I would have realized that God, um, that the priesthood wasn't my call and that God would have me marry Janelle. Um, I feel like I would have realized this a lot quicker in my life had I gone to the seminary. Uh, and in one respect, now it's hard to look back and say, oh, I wish things were different. But in one way, I think it would have been very good for me to go uh, seriously discern the priesthood, maybe even to seminary, because then I would have discovered much quicker that that was not God's call in my life. Instead, I felt like I wandered in the desert for a very long time. And it was a painful experience. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, and I was alone much of that time in trying to figure that out. And so I, I do think, now I'm grateful for how everything has turned out, that God's mercy is great. Uh, I don't know what my ministry would have looked like either, too. Like, it's, it's, that's, it's what these what-ifs are so hard to, to think about. But I do see the value in a young man, if he has the thought of the priesthood, really seriously diving into that uh, quickly, because I think it can help him figure things out in life earlier. Don't right. you think? Well, we can yeah. waste a lot of time wandering and wandering years or decades, and then we find ourselves in our 30s, and we're still trying to figure out our vocation. Mm-hmm. I, I always try to remind guys that the seminary also isn't just like 
the shallow end of the pool where you can dip your toe in and see how the water is and then decide whether or not you're going to jump. Uh, if you go to the seminary, it should be because you're 51% sure uh, or higher that you are called to the priesthood. You should sense that the call is strong. It's what you've, what's you've done leading up to that decision that is going to make a big difference. And so these guys who say to me that they don't even want to talk about it or go on a come and see weekend at the seminary or read a book about the priesthood because they've discerned that they're called to marriage. Well, that's, that's ridiculous. You, you can't say you've discerned that. You just want to be married. And there's nothing wrong with wanting that. But you can't call that having adequately discerned. Uh, if, though, you've had a spiritual director, you've been thinking about this, you don't know one way or the other which it might be, but after reading this book about the priesthood, you know that there's this little fire inside, and you wonder what it would be like, and you can picture yourself doing certain priestly things, that's enough of a reason to say, Okay, maybe I need to put everything else on hold and just try and go to the seminary and say, Lord, things are pointing in this direction. I'm open to it, but I count on you to show me. And he will. Uh, but you might also equally have done all of those things and said, you know, this does not sit right with me. I, I never have peace when I think about this. And you can not go to the seminary and still have been able to make a reasonable discernment. But these guys who are hopelessly torn one way or the other, back and forth, over and over, I do believe that there's a point at which you're not going to get this figured out unless you've tried to go to the seminary. So Father, thanks for your words of wisdom here. Do you have any closing thoughts for us as we close this conversation? Well, maybe I'll just go back to where we began about this idea of of being called to marriage, you know, I think that uh, that can be a source of pain for some people who really truly believe that they really want to get married and they just can't find a spouse. Uh, I, I just want to remind everybody that uh, the beautiful part of the Mass at the, before we receive Holy Communion, when the, the consecrated host is shown to us and we, it's, it is said, uh, Blessed are those who are called to the Supper of the Lamb. That's the, that's the sign. Right? This, is, this is the marriage to which we are all eventually called. Uh, that is where our destiny lies, eternal union with, with Christ uh, in the Blessed Trinity forever. Uh, and so, although it can be painful to go through in this life that uncertainty or what feels like prolonged ambiguity about our vocation, to just keep our eyes fixed on that, uh, that we are ultimately called to be with, with Christ forever in heaven. Thanks, Father, for your words. Uh, friends, thank you for watching and staying with us during this conversation. Please comment below what stood up to you and why. We'd love to hear from you, and uh, we'll see you soon, Father. Thanks for being here. Thank you.